There are about a hundred different shirts, signs, keychains, what have you, that you can buy with the phrase, not all those who wander are lost. But what does that even mean when you really think about it? My very scientific study involving a quick Google search says that wanderers are just those who are looking for new, exciting adventures and are more afraid of staying in situations that are no longer fulfilling. Given that definition, I think it's safe to say my next guest on the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast is a textbook wanderer, having gone from her hometown of Rochester, New York, to Ashland, Ohio, then up to D.C., and eventually landing here in Richland County, but always looking to grow both personally and professionally and make the world a better place in the meantime. I'm incredibly grateful that she's decided to stick around this area for the time being and especially glad to have her on the podcast. Now, before we dive into our actual interview, I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to one of the generous newsroom partners supporting the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast, Spherion Staffing. Their job is finding jobs, and they love what they do, which is something we both have in common. Without the support of Spherion, the solutions journalism work we do at Richland Source, including this podcast, just wouldn't be possible. For more information about Spherion, our newsroom partners, and our solutions journalism work, visit richlandsource.com forward slash solutions. From the Richland Source Podcast Network, welcome to Why the Hell Am I Here? A podcast that hopes to answer the big and small questions about where you are in life, where you've been, and where you're going. I'm your host, Brittany Shock. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast. Today's guest is uh, Jody Perry, who is president of the Richland Area Chamber of Commerce. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah. I'm excited to be here. I made the cut finally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jody has is an avid listener of the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast, so I'm super excited to have her on. And I'm super excited to chat today. We were kind of taking notes beforehand of what we were going to discuss, and I'm excited to dive in. You've had quite you know, the journey in this is what the podcast is all about, talking about how we got where we are today. So. Yeah, it's fun. Is it interesting, you think, to look back and be like, oh my gosh, this is, there's been a, a lot of twists and turns to get me where I am today. Yeah, for sure. I think it's always interesting to kind of look back. Mm-hmm. So I think when you're going through things, it never seems like much is changing very quick. But then all of a sudden you turn around and look, oh my gosh, a lot. <laughs> right. I'm a totally different person in a lot of ways or, <laughs> exactly. or things like that. Mm-hmm. We are similar in the fact that we're both um, not from the area originally, but then we moved here and um, have stayed for <laughs> the quite a few years. And it's funny because we were talking about when she first became president of the chamber uh, is like right around when I started at Richland Source. And I said, I remember covering the press conference where <laughs> you announced that you were and like had no idea who each other were at the time. And who knew that four years later, you'd be on a podcast with I know, me. <laughs> I know. Who knew how that would happen? Exactly. Did you expect to be here for as long as you have been? Well, I hoped to be here for quite a while, but, uh, you know, especially when you're moving to a new community, as I've done a few times, um, you never quite know how how life will work out. So, um, yeah, definitely that day I was I was excited about the opportunity, but uh, had no idea what lie ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Mostly in good ways, to be honest. But just want to make that clear. Pleasant surprises. (laughs) So, um, Jody, you were born in Rochester, New York, right? Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, I think when people think of New York, they automatically think of New York City. So where is Rochester in relation to New York City? So we're kind of on the opposite end of the state. So Western New York would be uh, how we would describe it, uh, right on the shores of Lake Ontario. So very similar, you know, Great Great Lakes part of the state. Um, and it was a great place to grow up. Probably the more I talk, maybe my Rochester accent will come out a little <laughs> bit. We don't say coffee, but, you know, I have a really short A sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so people love to point that out. Awesome. I, you know, there is supposedly a thing called the Midwestern accent, but I don't, I mean, I always feel like I just talk like normal. Like mm-hmm. I don't have an accent, mm-hmm. but I've never experienced that where I go into other places and they're like, oh, you talk really funny. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's a real strong accent here to my ears. You you have some words that you use differently, like sweep the floor for vacuum. <laughs> that was a new one to me when I came out here. 
But uh, I get picked on because I say elementary instead of <laughs> elementary. <laughs> elementary. <laughs> and I'm really conscious about it now. And it's so when I'm like, yes, it's, you know, Woodland Elementary School. I <laughs> yeah. really, I'm really trying, but it doesn't always come out. I know that we get a bad rap for saying ope. All the yeah. time, <laughs> which I never noticed until someone pointed that out to me. Someone, I I never picked it up either. But um, I was in Des Moines, Iowa, for a conference a couple weeks ago, and there was a a great t shirt store there that had all sorts of like midwestern fun things, and they had a t shirt about Ope. Oh my god! And uh, yeah, one of my staff members was was with me, and she's like, "I'm gonna buy that because I say that all the time." And I'm like, <laughs> "I never noticed it, but once she said it, now I hear everybody say it." Yep, yep, I can myself all the time and then I'm like oh gosh oh like, yep oh, oh. <laughs> hard not to it's really hard so uh Jody you told me that you grew up in a family of entrepreneurs and what does that mean and what was that like being in that kind of environment as yeah. a child and growing up like that so it was really interesting I think so my my grandfather um owned a restaurant and he was a developer uh, in in our small part of Rochester. Um, and my dad owned several businesses. He was he owned a bar. Him and my mom owned a bar together when they were first married. Uh, then he was in a construction business with his brother. Um, and then the one that they were in longest was they sold John Deere tractors. So he, okay. and, he and my mom started that when I was a kid. And then uh, his two brothers got into the business as well. And, and the four of them... Um, did that for, you know, close to 30 years. And it was huge to me. I think, um, you know, a lot of people assume, oh, you're the, you're the boss's kid. You know, you get all the cush jobs or, or, um, you know, in, in my grandfather's case, your granddaughter, he lets you off easy. And that was not the case in my family. (laughs) Yeah. It was, you know, they expected you to work twice as hard and you really had to earn what you got. So I, you know, from the time I was a little kid, remember going to the stores, the the John Deere store is what we <laughs> called it. And it wasn't always my favorite thing to do. You know, um, I, my parents worked so hard. And, and as a kid, you don't realize uh, maybe what they're going through. But, you know, I, my mom told a story about how one time for Christmas, when they were early on in their career, she asked for a haircut for Christmas because it was just... There just wasn't a lot of money. But oh as a gosh, kid, I yeah. didn't feel that. Right. Um, yeah. And they became very successful and, and it, you know, it, it changed. But um, that perspective, I didn't realize till I was older. But, but yeah, they had a stocking shelves, cleaning tractors as we got older. You know, I, I sold one tractor in my career as a tractor sales. And I was like, this is, <laughs> this is not for me. I don't understand it. <laughs> Still a running joke in my family. I don't quite get power tools. But um <laughs> Yeah, and then I worked for my grandfather, uh, pretty much doing everything at the restaurant, but waitressing was was the biggest thing, and uh, it's good. I mean, I, I think it taught me a, hu- uh, a very strong work ethic. Um, people accuse me uh, of being a workaholic, and <laughs> and I, I think I come by it honestly because of yeah, my family. Yeah, absolutely. Because really, yeah. when you're doing your own business, there's no off time. That's right, just yeah, what and you do. You're kind of doing everything mm-hmm. at some point or another. Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah. Chief cook and bottle washer. And <laughs> exactly. That's kind of how I approach what I do now too. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So um, those de- lessons have definitely carried right through sure. the rest of your life. Um, went to Ashland University yeah. for college, which I did not know. Which uh, that makes me laugh that you had um, a connection to this area at such an early time mm-hmm. because I always think of you as, you know, coming to Richland County because um, you came from Rochester and we'll get to that a little bit later. But I always think of that as being like your first exposure to here, but it really wasn't. No. So, yeah. Yeah. Randomly, I know things about Mansfield from like 20, 25 years ago that people are like, how did you've only been here for years. I'm like, you yeah, there. but I was in Ashland. I wasn't that far away. Yeah, totally. So, what yeah. did you study in Ashland? I was a political science and religion major and a minor in history. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> everything you're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table. That's basically what I was interested in. Yeah. Studying. Politics, yeah. religion, and money. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was great. I loved it. Um, that's but such a wide um, berth of things to study. In. It was a true liberal arts degree. <laughs> <laughs> and then Absolutely. figuring out what in the world am I going to do with this and how do I turn this into a career? Mm-hmm. And it absolutely I, you know, uh, I utilize a lot of it in surprising ways. But mm-hmm. and at Ashland, you know, their their poli sci is um, 
it's it's theoretical. You're studying the reasons why um, politics and governments are the way that they are. Uh, at least when I was there, that's what we were doing versus just how a bill becomes a law. It's not, you know, it's not just that. So I think it helped me to figure out practical thinking, laying out arguments, uh, per, you know, being persuasive, all of that I, I kind of attribute back to that time. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it as, well, I guess just in general, I don't really think about politics in mm-hmm. that sense mm-hmm. of like, why is it like this? It's yeah. more just, especially now, and well, which is a whole nother bag of worms. <laughs> um, so what, I mean, you know, coming from Rochester to Ashland, I mean, what in the world brought you to Ashland? And how did you find it, first of all, and yeah. decide, that's where I want to go to college? So um, so they recruited up there. And I say that not because they were they were not recruiting me specifically. Let me just, <laughs> uh, the, they, um, uh, they uh, set up in the different you know, college shows. And I was just, I don't know why, but I was a kid that was just set on leaving. I wanted to go away to school. And initially I was like, I'm going to go to California, like really far away. Every, why is that the thing? I, like, don't know. I don't know why. That's still a thing where people are like, I'm going to go to California. Yeah. I'm going to go out west. It's like the sunshine. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but. probably a little bit of that like um, weather change. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'm tired of winter. So I'm going to go somewhere warm. It's Hollywood. So. It's the land of dreams. I don't know. But Everyone I know from the Midwest who moves to California has always come back. Yeah. Because they yeah. say they hated it, just for the record. <laughs> yeah. I, I visited now a couple of times, and I love visiting, but I'm like, I don't know that that's where I want to mm-hmm. live. Yeah. But, um, so but yeah, anyway. So they so, recruited up there. And so you went west to uh, good old Ashland University. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> And it's funny, um, one of the the person that recruited up there uh, works in the area. Now she doesn't work at AU anymore. But uh, when I first came back, she came up and she's like, I don't know if you remember me, but I... I was your admissions counselor. And I'm like, how in the world do you remember me? That's yeah, like 20 years no ago. No kidding. So do you I, know how many students you I must know. see? <laughs> I mean, I, obviously that must say something about how awesome I am. Exactly. No, I'm I don't so know. memorable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, by the way. Um, but uh, but yeah, they were recruiting. And of course, I, I wanted to study poli sci. So Ashland um, is, is known for that. I was not an Ashbrook scholar, unfortunately. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was set to go. And, and then I got here and went, oh, my gosh, this is so far from home. What right, did I do? because how far is it exactly? It's like a five-hour drive. And probably when I started, the speed limit was a little slower. So it was like <laughs> six. But uh, yeah. it's gotten faster over the years. I mean, that's pretty significant. And, you know, yeah. to come – because did you know anyone out here? I had one – there was one other person from high school that came out, which was great. We roomed together our first semester, and so I wasn't completely on my own, but... It's still kind of throwing you in the deep end. Oh, yeah. As far as, like, here's the real world. Go. Drive. (laughs) Yep. And I'm coming from Rochester to Ashland, um, which I grew to love um, as a second home, but, uh, you know, as you do when you move in, your parents take you to Walmart or someplace to buy your supplies, and and I remember seeing the buggy parking at the, the Ashland the old Ashland Walmart and they were like where are we leaving you I don't know where this is and I'm like I don't know either we'll see how it goes (laughs) but it all worked out spoiler alert yeah spoiler alert it's a happy ending (laughs) um why you know I want to go back to this feeling of like I I just want to leave and I mean where does that come from is does it come from not enjoying where you were or just feeling like there was more to the world than just Rochester and I I think it was um, more of that, and and you know, I hear people talk about that a lot currently. Like, oh, we got to keep kids here, and I I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it's good for people to go. Um, not that you know you want to shove everyone out. We want them to come back, but. Um, I appreciated home a lot more years later after I left and went back. And I just think some of that's just natural. Um, some people, I think it's more in their system than others. I mean, I know some some of my high school friends never left and, and they have stayed and loved it. And they're totally happy that way. Um, so I don't know that there's a right or wrong. But, but yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah, it's, it's just everybody's different. And mm-hmm. um, I'm the same way, though, where it was like I... Uh, you know, I grew up in Dayton and I was like, there's no way I'm staying here for college. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was because I really felt that or if like everyone else kept saying that. And I, when I look back and kind of examine the reasons why I left, I can't really pinpoint exactly why. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I did. Right. Um, 
But yeah, it's interesting mm-hmm. how how that happens, and um, you know, especially if you know you grow up in an area where everyone's like, oh, this place sucks. Yes, you know, and you need to leave. Or mm-hmm. adults are telling you like, you don't want to stay here, yep. and you know that feeling of like, well. Why? Oh, why? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's a real thing. And I had that um, in Rochester. In a lot of ways, is very similar to this area. It's bigger, but the mindset and that that feeling of this place is not so great. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very familiar with that because yeah. that was that was what it was at that time. They've gone through a, a renaissance too. But um, I, when I moved home years later, I I really struggled with that. Like, am I? Is this? Am I? Am I settling? Am, is yeah. this? Am I? You know, and like, and, it, have I failed yes. because I'm come home? Yes. Yeah, it's. I totally get that feeling. And I got there, and I was like, that was so silly to think that way. Mm. But but it was a real thing. And I think you know, in my current job, it's like that. That's important for us to realize as we talk to people about coming back. That that that's something they're going to struggle with, and right. it's okay. Yeah, it's. it's I'm a, here to tell you, it's, it's okay. A co- it's an okay <laughs> thing. We'll get through this together. <laughs> so after Ashland, you said you spent some time in D.C. I right did after college. What yes. were you doing in D.C.? So I um, I left a semester early from school, uh, which saved me a lot of money, which was great. Um, and I did an internship at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Oh wow! Which was what took me there originally, and it was fascinating. I worked in there. Uh, publications department, so not in the museum side itself, but um, yeah, looked at manuscripts and did editing, and and uh, it was really it was a great opportunity. And uh, after that, I um, I just decided I wanted to stay and and let's work try to work on Capitol Hill. So that's what I did. I worked for the uh, U.S. Senate Banking Committee, uh, and so that was that was uh, an interesting time. It's <laughs> That's not like a poli sci major's dream, though, right? <laughs> Is to eventually to get the there. Hill. Yeah, yes, exactly for sure. That was definitely one of my goals, and and I loved it. I can't tell you that you know banking law is near and dear to my heart, but um, <laughs> no offense to all I the mean, bankers that I love. Kind of sounds like a nightmare to me personally, <laughs> but I mean to each their own. So yes. <laughs> I was not on the legislative staff. So um, I worked as their clerk. So setting up the hearings and our committee was the one it is it still is that where the the head of the Federal Reserve comes to testify. And at that time, it was Alan Greenspan. And so, you know, once a year we had this hearing um, that literally cameras from all over the world were doing. And and I helped our clerk with that. And so it was it was fun. It was it was definitely a lot. And. What uh, administration at the time? Uh, it was the Clinton administration. Okay. So, I uh, so it's been changed a lot since then. Yes, it has. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been to see to uh, DC since then? Yeah, I go. Um, I'm there usually once a year for a conference that I go to. And then I still I have cousins that live there. Mm-hmm. So I go to visit them too. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a stretch where I wasn't there very much, but DC has changed a lot since I was there in like 2000. It, or 98 to 2000. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it has changed a ton since I was there. First time I actually got to go to, to D.C. was, I think it was last year. Um, I was there, again, for some kind of conference thing or whatever. I, was, I think I was talking about the baby boxes at that time. Mm. And um, and I got to explore a little bit, which is cool. I went to go to uh, the museum because, of course. And, sure. Uh, <laughs> right up your alley. <laughs> exactly. But uh, I do remember, you know, I went to see the White House um, because I never had before. And it was a little difficult because there were a lot of protesters outside. Um, And I don't know if that was the same environment uh, as the Clinton administration. But what struck me was how tiny it was. Yeah. Like, it's when you see it in real life, it's very small. Yeah. Did you go in? I couldn't go in now. Yeah. Yeah. I have the time. Yeah, definitely if you have a chance to go and it's worth it. So when I moved there, um, like two weeks later, the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke. Oh, so no. yeah, so there was a lot going on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Try telling people you're an intern in DC during that time. Right, I was like, yeah. Uh, it's different, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, because um, you know she's, a lot more outspoken now. Yeah, than I've been seeing that. About that. Like, she, I think she, like, gave a TED Talk or something about that. It was, it was a little crazy. She but she's on young. Twitter now. Is she? Yeah. And she, a couple of weeks ago, tweeted about the fact that it was National Interns Day. And she was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> 
That's funny. Oh, boy. So um, what happened after D.C. then? And Because how long were you there? I was there uh, two and a half years, basically. Okay. So. And did you come back to Ashland then after D.C.? I did. So, you know, two years in D.C., um, I loved it. It was a great opportunity. But I could see that I was either going to have to go for more schooling to move up. And, and while I loved d- doing what I was doing, it just wasn't – as fulfilling as I wanted it to. So I did a complete 180 and came back to Ashland to do campus ministry. And uh, and that was a, a great opportunity. So I just worked a lot with um, women one-on-one, led Bible studies. I had to fundraise all of my own money, which was an interesting experience. Wow, yeah. Yeah, so I, I did that full time for two years. And then I was like, I need a paycheck again. (laughs) (laughs) This was fun. And it certainly helps in my current job because I have to fundraise for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, so that was a, uh, it was great, very fulfilling. um, But it was another change after that. Yeah, totally. Because after that, that was your first um, experience with like chamber work, right? Yes. Was um, after, and and it was in Ashland still, right? That's right. Yep. I was, I I wanted to stay close to campus. So I was looking to just get it back into an office setting. And I got hired as the assistant to the president over there to start. And um, then they gradually gave me more. I was doing economic research and communications. And I loved it. I realized it's this really unique intersection for me. So kind of my past with the business and growing up in a family of entrepreneurs, kind of that feel good, let's make the world a better place. And certainly uh, more than its fair share of politics. Yeah. So yeah, a little bit of politics, a little bit of I'm trying to save the world Mm -hmm. right so and I think everybody I don't know maybe not everybody I relate to that very much of like what can I do to make the world a better place yeah and how do I do that in my everyday life yes that's always been a driver for me and I Mm -hmm. realized after I had a really great boss there that she still is my mentor in the industry and I said uh, I think I was 26 or 27 at the time met someone else who was running a chamber um that was my age, and I thought, I didn't. I thought I had to be a lot older to do that. Do you think I could do this? And she was like, Yeah, I think you could. And so um, she started working with me. And like three months later, she came in with a job description for uh, the director of the Van Wert Chamber on the other side of Ohio. And uh, and I got the job, and then went, Okay, I don't know what I'm doing. You're going to need to help me with this. <laughs> so yeah. Do you remember that feeling of when you kind of realized that? wow, I'm really in the right place here. Like, this is really a good fit for me. I do. Um, I think it was, um, to me, it was at the Ashland Chamber when it started was because I I really felt like, like I said, those three parts of my life really came together. And then when I became the director um, in in Van Wert, um, the chamber there was small. It was me and one staff member. But uh, to be able to have the influence over what that organization did, that was really where everything kind of hit home. And I was like, oh, I really think I like this. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I, I, they were very patient with me as I learned. But um, but I really I liked that. And, and to be able to sit and influence the community um, was really fun and interesting. Mm-hmm. So, Jody, we are going to take a quick break here, but we're definitely going to run, run? We're going to jump back. (laughs) What (laughs) verb am I using here? We're going to jump right back in and talk more about how, like, now that you're on the path to, like, being in the chamber, how you came to be with the chamber for us here in Richland County. So, uh, take a quick break, talk about some of the newsroom sponsors that help sponsor the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast, and we'll be right back. The solutions journalism work we do at Richland Source, including the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast, would not be possible without the support of our newsroom partners, including PR Machine Works, Nanagate, DRM, the Visiting Nurses Association, Richland Bank, Mechanics Bank, Ohio Health, and the Area Agency on Aging. Seriously, I couldn't be more grateful to our community for believing in what we do here just as hard as we do. For more information about our newsroom partners and our solutions journalism work, visit richlandsource.com forward slash solutions. Now let's get back to the podcast. 
Welcome back, guys. So we are here still with uh, Jody Perry, who's president of the Richland Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, It's really hard for me to not say the Richland uh, County County. Chamber of Commerce. (laughs) You and about half of the town. So don't feel bad. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we've talked about how uh, she was born and raised in Rochester, uh, went to Ashland University for college, spent some time in D.C., um, came back to Ashland and started working at the chamber there. And that's how we kind of got into this whole chamber world. So uh, where we left off, you were the director um, in Van Wert, mm-hmm. right? And um, eventually ended up going back to your hometown of Rochester to work for the chamber there, right? So how did that come about? And- yeah, it uh, it came about unexpectedly. So I had, uh, you know, these kind of jobs don't come along very often. So I had mentioned to my parents, you know, if you ever see a chamber job open in, in New York, let me know, thinking that would be a long time from now. And uh, my dad called me. I was in Van Wert at the time about a year and a half, so it was pretty soon, uh, and said, oh, there's a job in, in Greece, New York that had opened. And um, so uh, it was somewhat public, unfortunately, because some, some things had happened there that, that weren't the best. But um, <laughs> But the positive was I learned about it. And so I threw my hat in the ring. And, and uh, after a, a long process, they they selected me. And, yeah, so it was uh, just two two years after I went to Van Wert, I was moving home and going through that soul searching. Like, am I doing the right thing? Do I know what I'm doing? <laughs> right. Um, at this point, how long had you been away from home? Um, since, uh, well, really since I had left for college. So it would have been about four. 10, 14, I can do math, 14 (laughs) 14 years since I started college. Wow. So what was that like going back to your hometown and being a completely different person, but you're in the same place? I feel like that'd be a weird transition. It was. um, I had to use Google Maps a lot. I was shocked (laughs) by that, but I'm like, I don't I don't know how to get to this spot. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what was really fun was it almost was like starting over. So I didn't live exactly in, in the little burg that I had grown up in, but not very far. And I certainly was, I was familiar with parts of that town, but um, but not the whole thing. So, so there was still an element of starting over. And Rochester, as I mentioned, had been, you know, was, was kind of on the cusp of going through a renaissance at that time. And so it was really fun to experience Rochester rebirthing itself and, mm-hmm. and what they were trying to do there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, and, you know, introducing my parents to things like, <laughs> I had no idea the city had this. I'm like, me neither. You know, it's really awesome. <laughs> and you've lived here for how long? That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> so that was really fun to me. I think it's interesting, too, to go back and experience it like as an adult and a working adult as opposed to when you're growing up and mm-hmm. you don't think about certain things. Like, I remember... Um, People have asked me before, like, oh, I'm going to be in Dayton. Like, where should I go to, like, to a bar or whatever? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I didn't live there <laughs> I when I was drink at drinking then. age. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's that different, like, you know, experiencing the city, you know, as a, as a grown-up, more or less. <laughs> For sure it yeah. was. Yeah. I mean, uh, the cool thing in high school, we would go down into the city to the coffee shops, which was still cool when yeah. I came back. But it was like, oh, there's also some really cool bars down yeah. there and <laughs> right. some great uh, restaurants and, and also the entertainment. Um, you know, uh, Rochester has a lot, similar to Richland County, actually. They have a really strong art scene. The Eastman School of Music is up there. So, um, so they have a lot of uh, great amenities in that way. And, you know, again, as a kid, I didn't really care about that. Exactly, so, right. Yeah, going in the symphony wasn't wasn't exciting to me. But, it, you know, when I was an adult, I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Right. There's so much to do mm-hmm. here. Yeah, things you don't realize. Absolutely. Um, so I, how long were you in Rochester as in the chamber? I can't remember. Seven and a half years. Okay. So. And I know that during that time, you actually went through some difficult stuff while you mm-hmm. were there, too. Um, do you want to talk about that? Sure, oh. sure. It was. Um, I was just reading back through. So I'm a journaler. I don't know if you do that, and it, you know, I'm not always the most dedicated to that. But <laughs> I don't. Know, I know I should, but <laughs> it's also like I write all day. Yeah. I don't want to go home and fair. write. <laughs> totally fair. Yeah. I have an entire p- parts of my life that I'm like I didn't journal, and there's huge stuff. But at any rate, I had a journal from um, right before I moved back home, and it said, you know, I just I feel like I'm supposed to go home. I I have no idea why. Um, I hope it's a good reason. And, you know, 
uh, it, and I think ultimately it was, but about three years into my time there, my mom got sick with lung cancer and ended up passing away. Um, so she was sick for about 15 months. And, you know, I'm so grateful that I was home, A, when she was healthy, because again, as a kid, coming home as an adult, you have a different relationship with your parents. And so it was fun during that time to just have time with my mom. And it wasn't like she was nagging me or I was nagging her, but, you know, we could just spend time together. Yeah. You're almost like friends with your mom yes. when you're an adult. I've had that relationship as well, like that shift, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, because I, I know my mom and I definitely had our share of disagreements oh when gosh. I lived there. So yeah. I was like, wow, you're an actually, you're, I really like you as a person. Let's yeah. hang out. <laughs> like, let's go on vacation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My mom and I uh, had similar personalities, which was great mm-hmm. until it wasn't. And I, then, I think that is absolutely the thing. It's like you, I, I know that she sees herself in me mm-hmm. and doesn't want, where like I'm a procrastinator and she's a procrastinator. So mm-hmm. she's like, it would be so much easier for you if you didn't do this. I know from experience. And it's like, I can't help it. <laughs> right, <laughs> so. right. I, I'm just going to have to learn this one. Exactly. I have so. to learn it the hard way. Yeah. But, um, you know, like you said, though, because I can't imagine what that would be like if you had lost your mom and you weren't there. Mm-hmm. And so it was really kind of a blessing in disguise. It and, was. and even her her sickness, I was just going to say, you know, I got so close to my mom during that point. And I would say um, I'm so grateful for that time. And of all of the a- – any – award or achievement or anything I'm proud of in my life, the thing, honestly, I'm most proud of is that I was able to caretake for my mom. And, um, you know, it was truly an honor and uh, to to help my dad. Um, And and my brother lived away from home at the time and he came home a lot. But but to be on the front lines there, because my mom always did that for her family. She took care of, you know, siblings and her parents. And so when she got sick, um, you know, she immediately went into that role for herself. And we had a fight. And I was like, you have to let me do this for you. And she did. And um, it was a huge it's 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 a blessing. And I, I've watched other people that they fight that they don't want to let people take care of them. And and I think that in a strange way, her illness, you know, was made better because she didn't have to worry about that. She knew we were there to, to help her. Mm-hmm. Um, it was extremely hard. And I don't know, like I worked full time through the whole thing. I look back now and go, how the heck did I do that? Right. You just do it when you yeah. need it. Mm-hmm. So um, so it was it was it was great. Got closer to her and then and obviously my dad. And so and then, you know, to be there for him after that um, and and as he kind of uh, figured out what he was going to do and, and moving on, you know, that was, it was a blessing in a lot of ways to, mm-hmm. to be there during that time. That's really crazy that you wrote that in your journal, yeah. like where you had yeah. that feeling of, I need to be here. And then to the way everything turned out, talk about looking back and mm-hmm. feeling like, Oh, everything, How did I know that? exactly. And everything turned out the way it was supposed to. It did. Um, so talk about then like towards the end of this, you know, seven and a half years that you were there, um, feeling ready to move on mm-hmm. and then why come here? Yeah. So, um, so I ran a suburban chamber up there. So I would, uh, say I was a small fish in a big pond and, um, I could care less about ego, but I want to, as you kind of have heard, like I care about being able to make a difference. And what I was finding was, A, I had kind of taken their chamber to the point where I thought I could um, with where they were at. And I just, you know, I could see I was going to have to wait 20 years to get a seat at the table to be in the big community. And I just was like, well, I could do that. Or... I could look and and go somewhere else. And so I started very casually looking at places where I knew people. You know, my college friends are still out here. My brother's in Michigan, family in Virginia. So those were kind of the places I was looking. And this job opened up and I was like, I was actually almost afraid to tell my best friend because I (laughs) I thought, I was like, what if I don't get it? I'm going to break her heart. (laughs) And finally, because I can't keep a secret very well, um, I did. And and, uh, and obviously it it worked out. But I was interested because I think Mansfield is similar to Rochester um, in a lot of ways, just on a smaller scale. And again, an opportunity to make a difference here. Mm -hmm. I'm much more interested to go into a job where there's uh, the ability to make changes than to follow someone who's 
you know, been the chamber exec for 30 years and beloved and, you know, nobody wants anything to change. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. The community was ready for things to change. And so to me, I was like, yeah. But I, and and really when I, I put my application in, went through the initial stuff, and then I had an opportunity, not for another job, but just a career opportunity in New York or professional opportunity. And I was like, "Mm, I'm not going to go for this Mansfield thing. I'm going to pull my name out. This is a good opportunity. I'll stay put a little longer. And and I had a first interview on Skype with Mara Tyner and Lee Tassif, and they reeled me in. It was just, <laughs> it was so fun. And I was like, oh, I like these people. Well, okay. Then they invited me back for a second interview with the board. And I remember sitting in our boardroom, you know, after going through like an all day interview and having lunch with them, thinking, if they offer me this job, I'm going to take it. Mm-hmm. And really, the people won me over. Yeah. The people here are just, that is what has kept me here, honestly, for mm-hmm. so long. It's definitely what reeled me in, especially if you're talking to, like, Jake and Cody and, like, the Shelby crew that right? were, like, be our friend. Come join. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, despite, you know, some of the challenges that this community and county and whatever faces, um, they keep me here. And have you had that same experience where it's definitely. like this is, I mean – the heart of the community is why Mm -hmm. it's a really great place to be, I think. Yeah, definitely. I was embraced from the start. And I thought, well, maybe that's just because I'm the chamber person. And, you know, um, but I've talked to a lot of other transplants that have had that experience. Um, I don't find it. A lot of times in smaller communities, it can be very cliquish. Nobody, you know, the Shelby crew doesn't want to take you in or something like that. And and I don't find that to be true here. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, that definitely right from the start, I was like, this was a really good move. I really my my love for this community is is very genuine. And, you know, it's funny. I've been here four years, which is hard to believe. I have made more friends in four years than the seven and a half I was in my hometown. You know, really, I, you know, I have people I can hang out with and and I love that. And Mm -hmm. it's just friend. I don't know if it's Midwest friendliness. I don't know what (laughs) it it is. No offense, Rochester, but um (laughs) Yeah. You got it going on here. Yes. Um, And I think it really speaks to you, and we kind of talked about this a little bit before, about um, you not being afraid to dive into a new community. And um, that really came from that first move, right, to Ashland. And um, I feel a little bit of the same way because I did the same thing when I went away to college. and. It's the same thing when I came to Shelby. And it's like, where do you think that comes from? Because help me understand me, myself. Like, mm. <laughs> why, why, why are we like this? <laughs> I don't know. Other <laughs> than uh, I think it is innate in some people. I really do. I think some people have that wandering gene that want to see things differently. Um, and then that aren't afraid to sit on the sidelines. Um, you know, so... Uh, when I went to, to AU, they do the Myers-Briggs test. And I tested as an introvert, which really people <laughs> shocks people. But I'm really an extroverted introvert at heart. I don't mind alone time. But, um, but certainly in my career, I've learned to, you know, the benefit of getting out. And I think when you move someplace, if you're just going to stay in your apartment or wherever you live – and never and only go to work every day, you're not going to love it. But if you take that chance and come to an event, get involved with young professionals or, or you know, go to a church or wherever it is that people are gathering, pretty soon you're going to get taken in. And, and then all of a sudden you, you feel that genuine love. Yeah. All of a sudden you have a community around you. Mm-hmm. You also like to travel way beyond. I do. Um, just Ohio and Rochester, basically. <laughs> um, so talking about not being afraid to, you know, get out there and travel and try new things. Um, you have mentioned that you've traveled overseas and even like by yourself before. Yeah. And that is a little t- intimidating to me to, um, you know, be traveling by myself. But uh, you said that it's been it's very important to you to be able to do that. And can you talk about like the first experience you had doing that and why that's important to you to get out and see new see new things yeah so um <clears throat> my my parents traveled a lot we grew up um camping every summer and then uh in their business they won trips overseas and the rest of the perry family really is not travelers uh-huh. but my parents got ignited with this wanderlust and pass it on to me and so i was always like i want to go to europe i just want to go to europe and so when i was living in dc i had a friend and she's like well let's do it really but we're like 22 we can't go to 
you're up by ourselves. And so we, we went, we were debating between London and France uh, or London and Paris. And at the time, it was before the Euro, Paris was cheaper. So that, that's literally how we made our decision. <laughs> Uh, neither of us spoke a lick of French, um, but we went, had this fabulous, and it was just very eye-opening to me, like, wow, people do things differently, and it's okay. And and as I've kind of gone on, and I, I had a long stretch where I didn't get that far overseas. I mean, I still d- traveled within the country and, and um, Canada, but... Um, but then eventually I went to China and Egypt, Iceland, Ireland, you know, far flung places. And you see like it's it's really different out there. And again, it's OK that you kind of have to figure out um, what do I love that they do that maybe we can bring back here. And um, I think that's really been impactful on how I do things now um, instead of just being so reliant on how I grew up and, and what I was familiar with. What has been your favorite place hmm. that you've been to? Everyone always asks that. <laughs> it's really hard to say. I, I think Egypt was a highlight for me probably just because it was so – being a history nerd, you know, seeing that and, and, and you know, thousands and thousands of years old, um, that was really fabulous. But each trip I love for a different reason. Like one of my favorite experiences was in Ireland, sitting in a pub, listening to music, talking to the people. And it was just, I still remember that. And, and, you know, I was with my dad, he traveled with me on that trip and it was just fabulous. Like they were the friendliest folks. Iceland is all about nature. You know, you're not seeing man-made things there. You're seeing, you know, uh, glaciers and volcanoes and waterfalls, and it was gorgeous. And, uh, you know, last year we were in Spain, and it was my first time in the Mediterranean. And, and to see just, you know, as far as you could see, olive trees. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, it makes me appreciate olive oil differently, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and now you guys are planning a trip through the chamber to go to Italy, we right? We are, yes. Are you so excited for that? Because have you been been to Italy? Conveniently, we picked a destination that I have never been to. I'm not <laughs> sure how that happened. But <laughs> no, I'm not. who decided yeah, that. <laughs> somebody might have had some influence on that. Perhaps. But uh, yeah, we. I have not been to Italy. And it's a, you know, that that's a destination that a lot of people have been to. And I was like, I need to get this one. So, uh, so we're doing Rome and the Amalfi Coast. Because I learned like in Spain, we did a little bit in a bunch of cities, but it was a lot of traveling. Fabulous. But I don't feel like I did a deep dive anywhere. And I thought Italy is so, there's so much there. I don't want to do the same thing. I want to focus and I, it'll just have to be one of many trips, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yeah, right. <laughs> I will say my boss, Carl Ferniak, um, has been to yes. Italy. He very much suggests it for the nice people and the food. Mm. So you you may come back like 50 pounds heavier because I know I That's would. That's a problem. I would but... eat a lot of pasta. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a, a tour of a limoncello factory on this trip. Oh, and no. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> that sounds like trouble. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> um, what's super cool about this, though, is like, I mean, anyone can go on this trip, right? Yep. I mean, it's just like the chamber is organizing it, but it's open to anyone. That's um, right. Was how was that experience when, because Spain was the same situation, yep. right? And yep. um, like, did you get a crowd of people that you had never met before? And um, like, tell me about that, like kind of these group trips where yeah. they're open to anyone. Yeah, it was, I was, um, so, you know, when I had done my friendship, it was just me and my friend. And I was like, I would never do a group tour. I don't know why people would do that. And then uh, China was the first one I did, which, you know, I wouldn't go to China on my own. You just, it's so different. You don't speak the language in that. Um, so, but that experience was like, oh, this is kind of nice. People, you know, you really, they they take you around and, and you get to know people from your area, which is what I loved. We've had smaller groups here um, in, in Mansfield. I did travel in New York too with our chamber and we had, we had larger uh, groups there. And, and something that I didn't expect is exactly what you hit on, like the benefit of getting to know people from your community in a different setting. And so, you know, last year I traveled with several local people um, in Spain and it was just, it was fun to get to know them outside of, of work and um, to have this shared experience together. And that's really what I, I love about these trips is, is that opportunity. Mm-hmm. 
And you had a very similar opportunity recently, right? Uh, yes. To go to the South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, which uh, if you are a listener of the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast, you know that we did a special episode um, like months ago with Jody and all 14 of her other <laughs> traveling <Closest> companions, <laughs> right? Yeah. Seriously, though, you guys cracked me up with, like, how close you got yeah. on that trip. And yeah. it wasn't even that long, but you bonded real hard <laughs> over it, that. Yeah. It was – I was shocked by that, too. Not because <laughs> I – I just – I wasn't expecting it. I was going in with this this one lens and um, the bonding that we did. You're right. It was, it was unexpected, but a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think now – especially as we get farther away from it, it's like it's great to have connections all over the community in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of like LU, um, Leadership Unlimited, but in a very condensed format was yes. was how it was. Yeah. It was like LU, but like survivor mode. Like <laughs> yes. we're just throwing all these people together. Um, but the reason that you guys went to South by Southwest was to like gather ideas and bring them back to Mansfield and look at the future in a more creative way and or in a different way that no one at to this point had looked at yet and Mm -hmm. jay always calls it like um, it's an inside job you know like we're transforming the community from the inside out um so he talk a little bit about that about goals you might have for the future um whether it be within the south by southwest group and that project or like just you know being president of the chamber and are you optimistic about the future of mansfield and um you know what do you think is going to happen next for our community so um, no shock, I am very optimistic about <laughs> our, our uh, community's future. <clears throat> I think that, um, so the South by Southwest project, to start with that, um, I don't think any of us completely knew <laughs> what we were doing when when we pitched this and, and went into everything. Um, but it's been really fun. The thing that's been the most rewarding to me is just the great feedback we're getting. So, you know, Brittany has been a front row observer on our Slack channel that we use to communicate with each other as a team. Um, so, you know, the bonding with us has been great, but also, you know, to see um, how many people in the community are following our progress. I won't lie, that makes me so nervous and I feel right. like yeah. a huge <laughs> sense of responsibility now. Uh, you know, when we planned this, it was like, is anyone even going to pay attention to what yeah. we're doing? Mm-hmm. And now it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, yep. they are. Mm-hmm. They yep. are. We're really accountable now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. But it's been really exciting to see um, when, when we did our public forum a couple months ago now, uh, we, we did an exercise where we just had people brainstorm how to use a particular space differently. And I thought, this might be hard for people to, you know, like, it's a parking lot now. What could it be? And, man, people came up with really great ideas. You know, we can't do all of them, um, but it was just exciting that people were excited about their community. And that's where I feel like the South by Southwest project has been fun. It's almost giving people, you know, permission to... um, to be excited about Mansfield. And then, you know, in my job as the Chambers and and RCDG, taking a step further back, there's a lot happening in this community. And there's a lot of people working really hard to make it a better place. And I think, you know, we're not quite at that moment yet where momentum has taken over and we're just cruising to success. Um, But I feel like we're getting close. And I feel like, um, you know, something that people don't often appreciate, but I think is really crucial when you study communities that have had success, is building that collaboration, whether it's, you know, the city, cities in the county, or the chamber in economic development, or, you know, the different arts organizations, or, or you know, whatever the, the different stakeholders are. I think there is a sense now that people are working together better than they ever have. Um, and we're continuing to make, try to, you know, we want to move that forward and and continue to make it better. But, um, I, that's one of the reasons that makes me excited about the future is that because when everyone's, you know, fighting over turf and territory, there's not really any room for success, um, at that point. But now I think everyone is really ready to say, 
no, let's work together and and make this a better place. And that's the the great thing about South by is, you know, there's 15 of us, there's a bunch of advisors, but we really have tried to um, include the public. And really this part of the process, you know, we have to deliver a plan, Mm -hmm. but then then the hard part kicks right. in. Yeah, which you got to actually do something exactly, with Exactly, right. Yeah. And you don't we'll want it people. to be another, like, J- you know, the three-ring binder that gets shoved in the closet right. and no one ever does anything. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting when you talk about, like, the public forum and involving the public and how excited people are, because um, I think that's such a huge part of it is um, – You know, in a city, you want your citizens to feel ownership of the potential that a community has and be the drivers of, you know, pushing towards success and whatever that may be, whatever form that may be. What do you think the turning point kind of was when it comes to like this momentum and excitement and energy? Because maybe it's been kind of gradually building, but it feels like we're really gathering steam right now. I'm trying to figure out like, how did this happen? How did we get everybody so excited all of a sudden about, you know, economic development and moving forward? That's a really great question. Um, I think there's been probably a few turning points. Um, Excuse me. Um, I think, you know, RCDG, when they formed, which is now almost 10 years ago, you know, they had a, a big public forum at that time and and got a lot of people involved and said, you know, we need your help to make the community a better place. You know, GM had just closed not long before that. Uh, the previous economic development entity was no longer viable. And, you know, people looked around and said, well, if it's going to be, it's going to be up to us. We're, we're going to have to figure it out. And so those founders rolled up their sleeves, opened their pocketbooks and started it. And and they did it in a very grassroots way, um, trying to involve the community. So I think that was a big step in that process. I think the work that uh, downtown Mansfield has done during that time as well has been huge. Um, you know, uh, I, I think around 2013, 2014 seems to be a turning point. I don't know what it is. We um, hired this great new president of the chamber. So. <laughs> I, I do think at, at that time, which was just purely coincidental, um, but that does seem to be a time that people started to get a little more optimistic. And, and it has nothing to do with me. I just happened to come to town at that time. But mm. you're, ha- you're taking advantage. Yes, right? <laughs> exactly. Sometimes people are like, they give me credit. And I'm like, no, 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 I cannot take credit for that. It just had good timing. But, um, but you know, uh, the, the Phoenix had just opened at that time downtown. I think there was new things. The vault had just opened up in Shelby. So there was just the sense of optimism, like, oh, there's there's things happening. And, mm-hmm. and the economy was finally recovering, too, which um, certainly plays a huge part. Mm-hmm. You know, jobs were being added instead of cut. And, and that always makes people optimistic. Yeah. And I think what's interesting when you mentioned that RCDG was, you know, 10 years ago, is this fact that it might take a little time, you know, in moving forward, like it might, it's not going to happen next year, right. you know? And I think that's important too, to realize that long-term success is, is going to happen kind of slowly. Marilyn John often, I've heard her say, you know, we didn't get here overnight and we're not going to get out of it overnight. And I think that that is, um, that's so true. And it's hard sometimes for people because I, I get it. Everyone feels like they've been waiting a long time. Um, but I think that there's extreme value in taking your time and doing it methodically versus just jumping. I mean, sometimes you just have to do that. I get it. Um, and we've done things sometimes before we're ready. But um, but I think you're better kind of doing it the right way from the start um, and you'll have more success. And that's something I've learned, like, you know, the great thing about this community and um, coming in from the outside is people are willing to help. They'll roll up their sleeves. Sometimes they're doing it quickly and without asking, well, who else is working in this space? Um, maybe can we help them versus starting our own thing? Um, so there's it's a double-edged sword. People are willing to help, but sometimes it gets more complicated because of that too. Yeah. But I generally tend to end up on, it's better that we have more, you know, more seats around the table at the end of the day. So do you see yourself being part of this vision moving forward in the future? Are you asking me if I'm going to stay? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) At least for, I don't know. I I don't know if 
this might be your forever position, but in the near future. Mm-hmm. My my, I, I have no interest in moving. Let, let me put it that way. Um, I really uh, I've really enjoyed it here. I learned in in Rochester the value of staying longer. So I kind of said earlier and I was like I was on like a two year stint for a while. <laughs> and then I, I stayed put and and in this position, you know, social capital is very important. The relationships you build with people, um, sometimes you can get things to happen just because of that. And that blows my mind sometimes. Like, that person is doing that just because I asked them to right. do it. Right, yeah. <laughs> not, not because of this great program or, or anything else. The value of relationships. Yes. I, I feel the same thing in journalism too like the value of like I have the chief of police's cell phone number and I can call him and ask him about things that are going on and it's very very helpful and like you said it's Mm -hmm. the value of being here and investing your time here for a while but it also makes it really hard to think about ever leaving it does (laughs) it does to, to unwind yourself from that and I think for me what I've learned is I I need to be challenged and and so I got to a point in Rochester where I just I felt like I had gone as far as I could with that chamber I loved it I loved the people I loved the community um but I just professionally wasn't having the same challenge and so uh, I chose to come here and I've got lots of challenges still (laughs) (laughs) well good that's good good ways (laughs) (laughs) well Jody we definitely hope that you stick around for at least a little while longer um because we I'm speaking for everyone but um I think it's safe to say that we really enjoy having you here so I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you were on the podcast so thanks for much I made the cut you did (laughs) (laughs) thanks so much for coming on um so if people want to learn more about the chamber or like what's going on at the chamber um I know you guys have a Facebook page right but how else can people get in contact with you so our uh, website is richlandareachamber.com uh we have a very active Facebook page so I definitely would recommend following that um um, and you can certainly give us a call if, if you want to do the old-fashioned route, 419-522-3211. Good. I was going to say, I hope you would know that <laughs> off the top of your head. Yes. So, um, again, thanks so much, Jody, for being in this studio with us today. And uh, everyone listening, if you want to hear more uh, Why the Hell Am I Here episodes, you can definitely follow us on com or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>